Hi, everybody, and a very pleasant good evening to you wherever you may be. This is Comfortably Zone Radio, and it's time for Dodgers Baseball, a tale of two cities, from Brooklyn to Los Angeles. I'm your host, Peter Trunk, and my co-host tonight is Boathouse Bernie Rose, as Linda Wilson is on assignment. Bernie, how are you, my friend? Doing well. How, how's it going? It's going pretty well, pretty well. Uh, I know it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's tough without any baseball anymore, the World Series being over, and uh, we're both kind of uh, baseball junkies, to say the least. And uh, now we're just following along the hot stove lead, but we're doing the best we can do. Tonight's show, right. the first part of the show, as usual, is going to be about Brooklyn. Last time we had a show, last time we spoke on the air, uh, I just touched on the year 1937, and then I hinted about that was the end, sort of the end of the daffiness days with the Brooklyn Dodgers. And when Larry McPhail came to Brooklyn, uh, all of a sudden the Dodgers became a powerhouse in the National League. And uh, right. yes, and uh, I just want to touch on a few things that Larry McPhail uh, did. McPhail was uh, known to walk a thin line between uh, being a genius and being insane. He was an alcoholic and uh, very verbose and outgoing and loud. He fired Leo DeRocher a number of times, only to rehire him the next morning. He, um, When he was in the Yankee front office, he actually was out drinking with Tom Yawkey, the uh, Red Sox owner, and uh, they traded Joe DiMaggio for Ted Williams. And the next morning when they both sobered up, they got on the phone and said, no, 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 we can't do that. And uh, probably probably <laughs> right. saved both of their lives. Probably saved both right. of their lives from the fans in Boston and New York. But anyway, Larry McPhail, he was in the front office of the Cincinnati Reds, and then he was in the front office of the Brooklyn Dodgers, and then he was actually in the front office of the New York Yankees. But uh, I want to talk about his time in Brooklyn. When... Um, Larry McPhail came to Brooklyn. Brooklyn was hapless. They had won a pennant most recently in 1920 and lost the World Series to the Cleveland Indians. And then they went on a string of, they were the daffiness boys. Uh, fly balls hit outfielders in the head, three men at third base. You know, uh, the, the old joke is the guy gets in a cab, guy gets in a cab in Brooklyn and says, Brooklyn's got the bases loaded, and the cabbie turns around and said, which base? You know, uh, they they, uh, they were sort of like the 62 Mets, but it lasted yeah. about a decade and a half. So they were terrible. Well, anyway, Larry comes to town, and um, with him, he's got a million ideas. And uh, he renovated Ebbets Field which was falling apart. He painted it. He fixed all the broken seats. He hired a cast of ushers. He saw ushers in Wrigley Field, Chicago, and he liked that idea. So he hired a whole bunch of uh, ushers for Ebbets Field, and he outfitted them. In All they had to do was have black shoes and a, a green tie, and he outfitted them in slippy hats and jackets stuff like that. He put them all throughout Ebbets Field. He, he put lights in Ebbets Field for night baseball. He figured that with the, with the people going to work every day, they didn't have time to go to a baseball game. Maybe they could go after dinner. So he put lights in and had night baseball. He increased he increased uh, home attendance so much. It was just incredible. And um, he he, uh, he held ladies' days. He uh, redid the clubhouses. He redid the dugouts. He um, then he started uh, getting players because you know you can do all of that stuff if you don't if you don't have the horses you're not going to win. The first thing he did was he got uh, a guy named Leo DeRocher, and um, 
He traded four guys for DeRocher, and no one could understand why he did that because DeRocher couldn't hit. Uh, Babe Ruth had called him the All-American out. Uh, <laughs> That's but, great. But Larry, Larry McPhail had a rabbit under his hat. And he knew what he wanted DeRocher for, ultimately, was to be the manager. Right. And, uh, then he started getting ball players. He got Joe Medwick from uh, Branch Rickey's St. Louis Cardinals. That's yeah. the trade. That's the trade that when Ricky, uh, that's when Ricky asked Larry McPhail to buy a guy for 100 bucks named Pete Reeser and hide him in the Dodgers minor league system. Right, Nobody right, we talked about that, because yeah. You know, right, he was, he, was, he was out there in the Cardinals system. The commissioner of baseball was cracking down on Branch Rickey and the Cardinals. They had too many people under contract, and he was, he was uh, announcing that it was illegal in baseball, and he was proclaiming certain guys free agents and everything. So Rickey got very nervous, and he, he sent Reeser – to Brooklyn for a hundred bucks and told Larry McPhail to hide him in the minor leagues. That's another story for another day. We, we exactly. did go over it a little bit, but anyway, the Daffiness days were over because not only did he get Leo DeRocher and then Joe Medwick. Joe Medwick was a big stud in the National League, big home run RBI guy. He also got uh, Dolph Camilli for fifty thousand dollars. He got mm-hmm. Dolph Camilli. He got Whitlow Wyatt. He got Dixie Walker. He got Pee Wee Reese. He got the aforementioned Joe Medwick. And he got a guy named Red Barber. And what he did with Red Barber is he started broadcasting games. Now, the Giants and the Yankees and the Dodgers had a signed pact among the three teams that they would not put their games on the radio because they all felt like that would hurt attendance, home attendance. Well, when McPhail got to Brooklyn, he said, to hell with that pact, and he broke the pact, and he put the Dodgers on the radio, and he put Red Barber as their announcer. He took him from Cincinnati, from where he came from. Red Barber was an announcer out there. So besides playing night games, the Dodgers are now on the radio. I didn't even know that. Yeah, go ahead. And – this began the Dodgers' success, which lasts until this very day, if you think about it. The franchise is known throughout the game as one of the historically successful ones in history, certainly ranking first behind the vaunted New York Yankees. That's my opinion. Anyway, uh, Leo, uh, uh, Larry McPhail also uh, used a yellow baseball in uh, Ebbets Field. Uh, everybody thinks that Charles Finley started that out in Oakland. Well, I'm sorry to say that uh, in 1939, there was a lemon yellow ball being played with in uh, Ebbets Field. And uh, Mc- McPhail, uh, before Red Barber and the radio broadcast of the games, the people in Brooklyn had to wait for the early editions of the newspapers to find out what the score was or how the Dodgers were doing. Right. No radio, no, nothing. Just that. That's all they had. Uh, or they would ask a neighbor who was walking back from Ebbets Field, you know, how did they do? What did they do? What, what happened? What was the score? <laughs> no one knew anything. But now with the radio, everybody had their Philcos and their Crosleys right in their own parlor. And they listened sure. to Fred Barber every day and every night, and they, they kept up with the Dodgers. And like I said, instead of hurting attendance, it helped attendance drastically. Got a lot of women interested in the game, too. They liked Red Barber a lot. Uh, baseball had changed forever. And uh, so had the Dodgers changed uh, changed forever. McPhail, I'm sure you're aware of this, but i just remind you. Larry McPhail is in the Hall of Fame, the Baseball right. Hall of Fame. He, he died in 1975, and he was put into the Hall of Fame, elected into the Hall of Fame in 1978. Um, he started air travel. He started batting helmets. He, he did. Uh, he, he was like he did a lot kind of stuff. Of, yeah, yeah. His son, you might not Lee know McPhail, this, his yeah. son, Lee McPhail, 
is also in the Baseball Hall of Fame. I was going to mention that, yeah. He was elected in 1998. He was uh, in the Yankee front office with all those great 1950s Yankee teams, and then the Baltimore Orioles with all those great right. Orioles teams with the pitchers and all that stuff. His yeah, grandson, yeah. Andy, uh, works for the Twins. So That's right. They say That's right. It's all in, that is it's all in the yeah. family. <laughs> it's all in the family. It's weird. But anyway, um, when the Dodgers experimented also under Lee McPhail with a televised game, uh, the first game of a doubleheader, August the 26th, 1939, they televised the first game. Um, no kidding. Not many people had televisions, as you can well imagine. But no, no, they did not. 39. A, a standing room only crowd at Ebbets Field, 33,500 plus, went to that doubleheader. They had two cameras, both of them in the stands, one behind home plate and the other one behind third base in the upper deck. The announcer, Red Barber, actually sat in the box seats behind home plate. There were three sponsors for that game, Ivory Soap, Mobile Gasoline, and Wheaties. There were no cue cards. There were no rehearsals. There was no, what would you call it, um, nothing to read from. There were no... Yeah, no statisticians, no, no right, nothing. Exactly. No nothing. And Red Barber said he had lived the whole thing when they would break for a uh, commercial, for instance, for mobile, uh, Red Barber put on a uh, filling station guy's cap and held up a can of mobile oil and ad lib for a minute. The same with the ivory soap. He would just hold up the soap and say something about the soap. He poured the Wheaties into a bowl, sliced some bananas, believe it or not, into the bowl and poured in the milk and said, this is the breakfast of champions. There That's you how go. That's did the commercial. Is that crazy or what? Six days later from that game, that was August the 26th, 1939, first televised game, of course, at its field. Six days later on September the 1st, the Dodgers and the Cubs split a doubleheader. Each game lasted under two hours. And the big news on that day was that uh, the Nazis had invaded Poland. So uh, basically, basically World War II started that day. And um, yeah, that's you know I, when I was reading all of this stuff about the old time Dodgers and Larry McPhail, I came across something that has nothing to do with Larry McPhail and very little to do with uh, what I'm talking about, but I just thought I'd mention it because I thought it was really funny. There was <laughs> there was a hot dog vendor at Ebbets Field between 1938 and 1940, and uh, I don't know his name. He was, uh, uh, like I said, a hot dog vendor. And, you know, they would yell out, hey, get your red hots, get your hot dog here, hot dog here, dodge your hot dog, or whatever. Yeah. He used to yell out, he used to yell out, they're skinless and boneless and harmless and homeless. Get your hot dogs. I thought that, I had to read that like five times. I said, this is funny. They're skinless and boneless and harmless and homeless. Imagine a guy coming through the stand selling hot dogs, yelling that out. I think I, yeah, I, think I would have had to buy one. I think I would have had to buy one. I'm thinking. Look at what he was yelling out. Anyway, that's all I got on Larry McPhail. And um, he, he was quite a character, quite a character, really. He was. Something something else, he really was. And now we'll do a little segue over to my friend, uh, Boathouse Bernie Rose, and we'll talk about another guy that was in the front office for the Dodgers, this time the Los Angeles Dodgers, and he lasted there for 30-some-odd years. And, uh, Bernie, why don't you tell the fans who we were talking about? Well, we're talking about Fred Clare, who had a little bit of a distinguished uh, career. He was with them for a long time, but, you know, really didn't get into the front office till you know, the last 
a bunch of years, but <clears throat> but a lot of things did happen. But we'll, we'll start out uh, obviously in, in California, and then he was out there. He got a journalism degree from San Jose State, and uh, was actually you know doing the I guess the sports writer thing. He was sent down to cover the Dodgers in Vero Beach. Oh, okay. All right. In uh, sp- spring training in right. 1969. All right. And, uh, you know, he uh, he was born in 1935, so you kind of get a little bit of a timeline with all that. All right. But in any case, he was sent down in the spring of 69, and he was working for the Press Telegram, and one of the assistants in the public relations department was fired, and he expressed interest. Fred Clare just expressed interest in the position, and the Dodger executives hired him in July of 1969. And he wow. worked in that position. Yeah, can you? I mean, I don't think it works like that so easy these days. I don't but you never know. So. Yeah, nothing crazy. ventured, nothing gained. But yeah, you know, I yeah. think back in the day it was probably a little easier. But just like that. In any case. Uh, he stayed there until 1975 when Red Patterson, who was his boss, left to go to the Angels. And he mm-hmm. moved into that position, a vice president of public relations, and was instrumental in, in the uh, catchphrases, Dodger Blue and Think Blue. Wow. Have become, you know, you know, there were, that's the Dodger Huge. Thing. Think blue. Huge. They're, they're still out there. When I when I drove up to Dodger Stadium, uh, all you saw were signs with "Think Blue, Think Blue" all over the place. Absolutely. Crazy. And uh, he was a big part of that, and uh, and he also was in, involved, instrumental in hiring Ross Porter, who was there for a long time. An announcer. Porter doing. Yeah, doing the announcing from 77 to 2004. Uh-huh. And uh, anyway, so let's let's get into some things here. Uh, you may remember an infamous uh, show, <laughs> well, the infamous Al Campanis show on Nightline. Oh, yeah. Yeah, when, yeah. Uh, he made a few unfortunate comments and didn't seem to really... Uh, I don't know what happened to him that night. Uh, He did not really seem to be aware of what he was saying, and he was gone pretty fast. Right. That's how Fred Clare actually got into uh, that job. With with, uh, he was hired for uh, player personnel responsibilities, and then Peter Uh O'Malley made him GM later on in 1987, which was okay. Now, all 19. if he became general manager in 1987, before that, he was other than general manager. He was like vice president in charge of blah, blah, blah and stuff. Could exactly. That's trades? exactly right. Could That's he make trades? I... Could he make oh, trades yeah. or, or, or did he have to wait until he was general manager? Oh, oh before trades? then? Yeah, I think yeah. pretty much that's when he started doing that in, in 87. Okay. All right, he, just wanted to clear that I, up. I don't have a whole lot of, of what he was doing, as, but it was play of personnel responsibilities. All right. But but he wasn't involved in trades. He was involved in other things with the team. All right. And But but you got to give him credit. The Dodgers did not have a good year in 87. And in 1988, we are still living with that as our last World Series appearance and triumph. Exactly. Exactly, and, and Fred Clare was the GM, so you could say a lot of things, uh, but uh, you know he did get that done, and and I, I would I would venture to say he, he made some decent moves, but what I'm going to get into over the next couple of minutes are not going to be decent moves, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, and okay. you're going to remember a lot of these, but All right, uh, but. But they, he did pick up, and, and I forgot, actually, they even picked up Jesse Orozco, who was very instrumental in the Mets winning in 86. Yep. And actually was on the mound when when they clinched. 
uh, and was their big closer. Uh, he brought in Jay Howell and Jesse Orozco in the bullpen. He brought in Alfredo Griffin and Mike Davis and Kirk Gibson, who, wow. whether he deserved it or not, did win the uh, MVP of the league that year and uh, yeah. with only 76 RBIs. But, yeah. but he was very instrumental in, in, in helping the Dodgers finish in first place. Um, mm -hmm. But in any case, bringing all those guys in, and they did win the World Series. So uh, that can't be stressed enough, I suppose. But as you get into the 1990 season, Daryl Strawberry was brought in with a five-year contract. And I guess $20 million was a lot back then. Uh, mm -hmm. And Strawberry had come off of an extremely strong year with with the Mets and uh they brought him in and uh, and as Tommy Lasorda said don't call Darrell a dog dogs are loyal and run hard after balls so <laughs> <laughs> that is a Tommy Lasorda quote that I will never forget wow. but you know Darrell Darrell did uh, have a a tough time in LA as we know with uh yeah. his drug use and, and and other things. He had chronic back problems and basically was a complete underachiever with the Dodgers. And the drug He use... did. I, I remember one thing about Daryl Strawberry in, because I was a Mets fan when he was in his halcyon days, but when Daryl went to L.A., I remember that he had 99 RBIs with one game to go. One regular season game to go, and he set that game out. And that sounds I, familiar, yeah. From 3,000 miles away, when I looked at the next day's paper in the box score and I saw that Darrell hadn't played, hadn't pinched it, there was no sign of his name, I said, something's wrong. And, of course, I wasn't privy to the drug use or anything like that. And then when that came out later, I put two and two together and came up with the answer. But, you know, for a guy with 99 RBIs not to play the final day of the season, sure, it, sure. It, it struck me as something very, very strange. Now, didn't didn't they get that – didn't they get Eric Davis to try to look – Oh, yeah, yeah, Darryl we're getting into there. that. That was the following All right, go ahead, go ahead. Go in 91. But, uh, yeah, but I'm not going to blame Fred Clare as uh, – it, 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 you know, for as a bad thing for getting strawberry at, at the time, I no. was thinking it was great. I remember that, Daryl. No. You know, uh, and, until the drug use, and you know, he might have had some back problems, but he could have had a much better career than he did. He he threw a lot of that away. He was a talent. There's no question about that. Yes. Uh, but but in '91. Claire traded Tim Belcher and John Wetland. And Wetland, mm -hmm. you know, they, they went to Cincinnati for Eric Davis and Kip Gross, which was a really bad trade. Eric Davis never did anything for the Dodgers, really. Uh, uh, John Wetland went on to become a tremendous closer. And the Dodgers were looking for a closer for many, many years. You, mm -hmm. you, might, you might even say they continued to look until they got Kenley Jansen. I mean, they... <laughs> I mean, yeah, sure, they had some, some guys here and there. And, uh, Mike Marshall. Eric Gagne was... It was a long uh, time before that, though. But Mike Marshall yeah. was back in the 70s, right? Wasn't Mike Marshall there in the 70s? Mike Marshall I'm not talking was about the, the first baseman. I'm not talking about the first baseman. I'm talking about... Oh, the pitcher, the yeah. He was, in the, he was in the 70s, right, right. Yeah. So, One year he pitched like 104 games or something like that. Oh, yeah, he won the Cy Young Award. Right. Yeah, but, he was in. Yeah, but that was before theology. Steve Howe. Steve Howe also had the drug problems. Right. Uh, and and I think he was on the '81 team that won the World Series, and then he went. He was completely lost to the Dodgers after that. Right. It kind of ticked me off in a way that Strawberry and and uh, and Steve Howe made comebacks, you know, and and you know, with the Yankees and with the got Yankees, World yeah. Series rings, you know that. Kind of pissed me off in a way because it took them a long time. I mean, Steve Howe is amazing how many chances he got. Oh. But anyway, I don't want to get 
sidetracked here, but uh, right, right. Don Wetland was gone in that trade. And just as long as we're talking about relief pitchers, they also let John Franco go. These were Dodger prospects that went on to become tremendous closers, and the Dodgers yeah. lacked in that for a long, long time. But anyway, mm-hmm. also that Davis and Strawberry thing that they, they, you know, the two friends back together that they put them on the front page of the of, of the yearbook, and, and it, that just never worked out and didn't last long at all. Right. Um, and then uh, there was a contract dispute with Jody Reed, and and they needed to do some some shaking up things, and they needed a second baseman, and possibly the worst trade of all time, certainly for the Dodgers, perhaps in all of baseball, when you consider the fact that they wanted a second baseman, so they went out and got the line of the Shields, and and they traded Pedro Martinez to get him, and that that trade that that trade reminds me of Ernie Brolio for Lou Brock. Mhm, mhm. Remember that trade? Maybe they didn't really That's, know how good he was going to be, but I didn't like it when it happened. But I didn't know, you know, I nobody really knew, I guess. But we found but out his very brother quick. Ramon. Wasn't his brother Ramon Martinez? Didn't he have a very yeah. good year in L.A.? So oh yeah, and, I, and they were thinking I, Ramon was the better pitcher, right? Exactly. They thought he was the better pitcher, and they thought that Pedro was too small. Yeah, yeah, they did. That that, mean, that, that, that 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 he would break down, and he would never be able to throw uh, 200 innings a year and do that stuff. Boy, did he prove them wrong. And Delino oh, DeShields did nothing for the Dodgers year after year. Nothing. And, and, and Pedro went on for a decade and a half to eight all-star teams and three Cy Young awards and I don't know how many World Series victories. Uh, but that's enough right there. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, in, in a, it's a shame in a sense that he's I, probably remembered more for – for some of those things there, than then for actually putting that World Series winning team together. Although, yeah, you know, is, that's a shame. It is. It absolutely is. And then he got caught up in uh, that whole Rupert Murdoch News Corporation stuff, uh, and that was pretty much right in the handwriting on the wall, really. The Dodgers knew ownership went ahead and made a big blockbuster trade without Fred Clare's knowledge. I think you'll remember that. All right. Which and one was that? Mike Piazza. Which trade? Oh, yeah. The Mike, they went out, and it's probably the biggest trade in Dodger history. Mike Piazza and Todd Zeal to the Marlins for Gary Sheffield, Charles Johnson, Jim Eisenreich, and Bobby Bonilla. I don't even really okay. remember Bonilla staying with the Dodgers much. Uh, Eisenreich was maybe there for a little while. Charles Johnson for for a period. Uh, Sheffield yeah. actually played well in L.A., but he did. it was done without the GM's knowledge. You know, so that was pretty much. He was furious that Fox News officials would make such a deal, and and Piazza had been with the organization for over a decade, and you know his whole history with. Tommy and 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 yeah. it was Mike Piazza. He was yeah. He was like Mr. Dodger at the time. Yep. Yep. Uh, and so that shortly after that, the whole thing with uh, Bill Russell and and F- Fred Clare were gone, and right. uh, they were relieved of their duties. And what they called the Sunday Night Massacre, when Glenn Hoffman, uh, which I really barely remember, you know being named manager, uh, wow. but I, he probably lasted about as long as Russell did because <laughs> I, I have not of a, not a very good recollection of what he accomplished. And I guess apparently Tommy was made GM, which that couldn't have lasted all that long either. But mm. that appears to be, be what happened because Tommy, you know, was made a vice president and sort of like a spokesman 
and and and, yeah, and, that was and, all, that and was Dodger all. icon, for, you know, for forever and yeah. still is. That was in. in but in, I don't in, remember in a whole lot only, of the Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're, what do you I recall? Think, I the way I remember it was that uh, whatever position or positions plural that Tommy Lasorda had after his tenure as their manager, any other position that he had, you could call him a GM, you could call him a vice president, you could call him a president, you could call him anything you want. It was a name only. It was just his name, Tommy Lasorda. Yeah. He, he was exactly. like the Dodger Blue. He bled Dodger Blue. He when did. I put the schedule put the schedule on my tombstone so people know where the Dodgers are. Absolutely. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So no matter what they named Tommy Lasorda at, at, at those different times, I'm sure it was just it was just a letterhead. It was just a figurehead. It really didn't hold too much water. Those were not good days uh, for Dodger fans. Those no. those days were they, they were unstable. They were, um, you know, like the the front office and the ownership always was trying to pull the wool over everybody's eyes. They were trying to pull a rabbit out of a hat. They really had no idea what they were doing most of the time, and that was a yep. bad era. For Dodger baseball fans. And then it was followed by the McCourts, you know, which for a while was okay, but that turned into a bad era as well. Uh, um, you know, the McCourts, I, I don't have to mention to anybody who, you don't even have to be a Dodger fan. You just be a baseball fan. <laughs> the, the horrible, horrible things that the McCourts did to that franchise or attempted to do, they stole oh, money. Yeah. They skimmed money from there for jewelry and extra houses. Right. And, well, it was just, it was disgraceful. It's absolutely it was. Baseball. Um, but you know what? I'm glad that you talked tonight about Fred Clare because I um, recently uh, friended him on Facebook, and Fred is going through some stuff now. He's got jaw cancer, and um, he's, he's going through some, some uh, tough times. He seems to be a really nice person. And um, uh, yes. I'm go- I'm, I, I have ordered his book. He wrote a book, Fred Clare, 30 Years of Dodger Blue. Uh, I ordered his book through um, through Amazon, and I haven't received it yet. But when I receive it, I will eat it up like uh, chocolate candy. I will read it from cover to cover. And we, in the future, Absolutely. we're gonna ha- we're gonna have to do another we're gonna have to do another show on Fred Clare because I have a feeling that there's a lot of dirty laundry in that book that will be very interesting for uh, at least I a, would think the Los so. Angeles yeah. portion of our show, you know? You know what I mean? A, and when we, get Linda, when we get Linda in here, Linda Wilson back from, uh, from her uh, day off tonight, night off, I'm sure that if she hasn't, uh, I'm, first of all, I'm sure she read it. If by chance she has, oh, she has. Yes, yeah, she has. I'm, I'm, I'm She's sure got she it. has it in her baseball library, and she'll be able to talk about it for half an hour. So that's what I would like to do. She's that. our, oh that's yeah, she's our West Coast very, connection. I mean, I'm yes, sure she's yes. very informed on that subject. She's our California connection, and uh, we need her badly. Uh, next time we talk about Fred Clare, she'll be able to fill us in on a lot of stuff. But uh, I thank you for for your contributions tonight. That they, they were very interesting. Makes me sad to hear the things that you said, not, it, because I it jogged my memory. Not that I never heard of them, but it jogged my memory about how, to me personally, how sad it was about a, a fellow like uh, Daryl Strawberry just kicking away a Hall of Fame career, and um, it it you know. It's just sure. Even though I, I agree that Tommy Lasorda made that statement. In other words, it was a great statement. Don't say that Daryl's a dog, and then you think, oh, he's going to stick up for him, and then he says, uh, dogs are loyal and they run after balls. That that must have really went down. Uh, that must have gone down uh, not too smoothly for Mister Strawberry when he read that in the press, and you know, again. We're missing our California connection. Linda right. will probably be able to tell us exactly what the writers out there were saying at the time, and 
you know, all the poop, all the all the dirt and stuff. Yeah, that would be some nice uh, research. I, I, I'd actually exactly. like to see that. You know, I yeah, so. as a Dodgers fan, I was uh-huh. I was probably just as mad at him as, as Tommy was, but you know, yeah. just as a as a baseball fan, you know, it, it was a shame, and I was glad to see that he did resurrect himself, even though yeah. somehow. It, it was. It just didn't seem right. <laughs> he was winning World Series with the Yankees. Yeah, after, he did it with the when, Yankees. When I That's thought he was going to be winning right. them with the Dodgers, uh, because of those five years was were was so miserable, and he really did. And you hate to see a guy throw a, a career like that away. Yeah. Uh, even though he did, you know, make a comeback. And, and if you and just look at his success, stats, if you just look at his stats, he had a very very nice career. But if you get filled in with the rest of the story, it's a damn oh, thing. Yeah. Because he, he, you know, on a scale of one to ten, he could have been a ten, but he wound up like. Oh, he could six. have been a Hall of Famer. He's he had good. talent. Right. Oh. Six is a good. Six is a good on a scale of ten, but it's not a ten. And he could have been a ten. He could do it all. Right. He oh could. yeah. He could do and, it all. And in talking and don't get with... me started. And don't get me started on Doc Gooden too, because Doc yeah. Gooden. Well, well I know it's the same thing. Then he resurrected. Then he resurrected himself with the Yankees of all teams, threw a no hitter, et cetera, et cetera. Right, and, right, you know, right. It came back to absolutely in the ES twice. Not only strawberry, but good. But uh, and the funny thing is, you know, uh, be- before all that, while Darrell was still uh, in '88, the year that, that the Dodgers won with Fred Clare as the GM, uh, Darrell yeah. had a great year with the with the Mets. Uh, Dodgers yeah. took them out in the playoffs. Uh, because yeah. Oral was so fantastic that year, and Mike Sosha hit a big Sosha ninth inning home run, run yeah. off Gooden. That was the if killer. I'm not mistaken. And, yes, and he did and, off of Gooden. And that off vaulted of them. In, in, if that wasn't the uh, game winner, it was certainly a, a big part of it. And um, that broke the Dodgers the had lost. Yeah, the Dodgers had lost 11 out of 12 to the Mets that year. And beat them what in in six, in, or maybe it went seven. I don't even remember. But they beat whatever, them in the playoffs. Whatever went, with... they beat them, and it was uh, it was it was it was sensational for Dodger fans, and it was oh, hard yeah. for Mets fans. Uh, oh, it was. But where I was going with that was that uh-huh. Dow had a great year that year. Yeah. But Kirk Gibson got the MVP. Uh, hmm? Dow had more everything. Yeah, I mean he had. More RBIs for sure, because Kirk only yeah. had the 76. He had more home runs. I yeah. don't know what his average was. I didn't really get into all that. But but Kirk Gibson meant so much, I guess, to the Dodgers that somehow yeah. the writers gave it to him. But it still shocked me, and I still to this day think Darrell probably should have won the MVP that year. But, yeah, I, I I have to I have to agree with you. I have to agree with you. You know. Uh, the, Changing the subject a little bit, uh, those New York Met teams of 85, 86, 87, and 88, they should have been in the World Series all of those years. They, yeah. they screwed up royally. They screwed well, up royally. Yeah, yeah. That team. Really well, I, they had a, sure. They had a great team in 85, a great team in 86, and they did go all the way. But in 87 and 88, they should have gone again, and they didn't. They should have gone like four years in a row, and they only won one. Oh uh, yeah, and 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 then there we was, found out that there was drugs. Uh, I mean, Gooden and, and Strawberry, the main stalwarts of the team, were snorting cocaine. I mean, you right. know, and and you know, it just breaks your heart as a baseball fan. And thank God we, you and I, at the time, weren't like eleven years old. Because if, if we had been eleven years old, we no seriously, we might have chucked the whole thing and said, you know, some this is BS. Forget baseball. And yeah, you know, yeah. You broke my heart with the, you know, you're snorting cocaine. You're telling me uh, that I'm supposed to look up to you, and the, it was horrible, right. horrible, horrible. Sure, sure. And then you it know really there was. were a number of, uh, there was at least two or three of those uh, four, five, six year periods through the uh, '70s, '80s, and maybe even the '90s. You know, where I thought the Dodgers certainly in, in the late '70s, early '80s, where I thought the Dodgers should have been the World Series every year. Uh, yeah, and they were in it in '77 and '78, and 
it still killed me that they didn't win one of them, especially after right. winning the first two in 78. Uh, but at least mm-hmm. they turned the tables on the Yankees in 81. But in 1980, yes. they, they had a, they, they swept the, uh, Astros on the, the last three games of the year. They were three out. They swept the Astros three games. Yep. And, yep. uh, tied them. And I said, this is it. We're going all the way. And then in the one game playoff, they got wiped out. And the, yeah. for the three games, they completely destroyed the Astros. And then yeah. in the playoff game, I think they lost 7-1. to one. It was 7-1 to one like in the third inning or something. I don't yeah. In, in Dodger the, Stadium, too. Yeah, very exactly. Difficult to watch. They, they were way right. behind very early. It was exactly. very difficult to watch the rest of that game. You know, yeah. to watch the last six or seven innings of that game. You, yeah, I just had it on in the background. I was it was surprised. torture. <laughs> yeah, All exactly. Right. I, I, I just it's kept terrible. it on. I, I couldn't turn it off. If it was today, I probably would have turned it off. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe not. I, I guess I can't do it. You and I both. It. But, uh, yeah, that, that, that was a period from 77 through, through 82. Because in 82, they lost in the playoffs to the Cardinals, I think. I forget who they yep. lost to. But, yep. Uh, Jack Clark was that the it, it, no that was eighty five Jack Clark that was eighty five oh, but it, maybe it was yeah. maybe it wasn't to the Cardinals I know they lost to them a couple of times but uh, yeah. but those teams they had they had everything they had everything but at least they did you know, pull one together in eighty one so at a, for that if you re, if, if you read if you read Dodger history it may, maybe you weren't born yet or if you were born you were too young to realize you were. You were running around with your friends. You were three years old. You were five years old. You were whatever. But I'm going to tell you something. The Dodgers won the pennant in 1941. They finished uh, second in 42. Then the war years came. But after the war, the Dodgers were tied with the Cardinals in the 1946 season when they could have won that. In 47, Mm -hmm. they won. 48, they were right behind somebody. Uh, the Boston Braves, and then in 49 they won. In 50 they lost in the ninth inning to the Phillies, the Whiz Kids. Snyder hit the single, and Ferrilla was thrown out at the plate. Ashburn threw him out at the plate. Uh, in 51, Bobby Thompson got him. Then yeah, in 52, yeah. They won in 53, they won in 54. Willie Mays came out of the Army, and they beat Brooklyn by four games. In 55 they won it all. In 56 they won. And in 57, uh, the Fat Man. Yeah, they won a lot of pennants, uh, yeah. Got, they kept you know losing what? the World Series, but, yeah. If, but if, if things were a little bit like you were talking about the the 1970s into the early 80s, how many mm-hmm. times they could have could have slashed? Right. Oh yeah. Well, well, it was one. well I'm going to tell you something. From the 40s until they left Brooklyn, they had a chance, a good chance, an outstanding chance to win every year. Every. Yes, they did. Year they yep. would have been like the Yankees. They would have been like the Yankees of the National League. They could have won every year. You look back at those Dodger teams. Oh yeah. And you see, and you look at the standings. If they didn't win it, they tied for it and lost in the playoff. If they didn't. Oh yeah. If they didn't, if they didn't tie for it and lost in the playoff, they lost the last game of the season. They never sure, went sure. down to the second division twenty games out or anything like that. They were all, and this is this ties in with how I started the show off. Tonight's show, I started off. It was the changing of the guard when Larry McPhail got there. He, even though he was a little insane at times and he was an alcoholic and everything, he brought that franchise in from the laughing stock from the circus days. He put yeah, them yeah. in underneath the tent of they were the powerhouse. They and the Cardinals became the powerhouse of the National League as we know it today. Sure. And they they sure. they still oh, are they a were. turning storied, storied, storied franchise. The Dodgers, very storied franchise. No one laughs at the Dodger franchise nowadays or in my lifetime. Before oh, my no, lifetime, in the yes. 60s. In the right. in the early '60s and the, to the mid '60s, they they, they, were, they could have done it. They they lost a playoff to the Giants again in '62 when they tied at the end of the regular yep. season. Yeah, and that also went. To then the, they came back to, to the late Yankees four in a row. In yeah, but then then they 
Then they swept the Yankees four in a row right the next year. I don't know what happened to them in 64. I know the Cardinals won the whole thing and won the pennant in the, in the World but, Series. But, but, but they were there they won, in 66. Well, they won it again in 65. They beat the Twins in the World Series, and they went to the World Series again in 66. That's like a five-year stretch. They really could have won it every year, too. So Right. That's why it it, it kind of kills me that they've never won the World Series two years in a row. I mean, it's it's very sad (laughs) when you look at how many times the Yankees did, you it's it's crazy because a bounce here and a bounce there and everything and we all know baseball. We know baseball. That's it's a game of inches, you know. I mean, you sure. know, it, it was was that strike three or was that ball four? Was that a fair ball? Or was that a foul ball? Was that you know whatever you know blah blah blah? Oh yeah. Go on and on and on. All I'm saying is this. I'm not saying they should have. I'll take that back. I'm saying they could have very Absolutely. easily could have become the National League version of the New York Yankees. They could have been in the World Series five years in a row, and then they'd be out, and everybody would say, what the hell happened? Then they'd be in it five years in a row right. again. And then, I hear you. know what I mean? And, 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 like in a 15 year span, In a 15-year span, they could have been in it a dozen times. That's what I'm World saying. World. From the, like you said, in the late 40s through the 50s, in the early to mid-60s, then again in the 70s, and they had some good teams in the 80s and early 90s where they they could have done it as well. But uh, yeah. I, I, I would take getting there and losing compared to going, you know, 29 years without getting to the World Series. It almost seems impossible that the Dodgers would not have <laughs> been in the World Series for this many years. It, it, if you would have told me that, no. you know, 30 years ago, Never I would have said impossible. No, right. impossible. Well, if you would have that, told me the that, Cubs would win the World Series before <laughs> the Dodgers do in the next thirty years, I would have said, "Are you out of your freaking mind?" <laughs> if you told me that Donald Trump would have been, well, let's not go there. Well, let's um, not even go there. Right, let's not go there. But anyway, listen. Thank you for a wonderful show once again. I know we both miss Linda. We'll have her, Linda Wilson. We'll have her next week with us, and we'll talk. Absolutely. Uh, messages. We'll message each other uh, during the week. Thank you for a good show, and it's time yeah, to say Yeah, we did. Tonight. It was good. Very enjoyable. Yes, Thank it you. was. It was. Very good. Okay, thanks a lot, Bernie. Good night. Talk to you soon. Take care.